Hi, everyone. Welcome to Wellness on Wednesday. This is an inform informational and fun, and fun, that's important, uh, series dedicated to promoting walking as a powerful tool for improving health and reducing arthritis and joint pain. I'm so delighted to bring this, um, that we're able to bring this uh, series of virtual talks uh, to you because of the esteemed Rochester Clinic and Lotus Health Foundation. So for those of you who are uh, new to me, I'm Denise Stiegel. I'm the curator at livinghealthylist.com, and I will be your host through the Wellness on Wednesday uh, program. Rochester Clinic and Lotus Health Foundation, with their strong focus on community well-being, are at the forefront of spearheading this series of health talks that delve into the topics of whole food, plant-based nutrition, and activities uh, that will improve uh, your arthritis health. And thank you to Let's Walk Minnesota, which is a campaign sponsored by the Minnesota Department of Health uh, and is funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, we do have the opportunity to bring this initiative to you uh, throughout the month of June. Uh, and through this series of talks, all of our presenters will guide you in discovering that potential just walking has to do um, to provide insights and they'll also enhance your quality of life through movement, nutrition, and of course, lifestyle medicine. So I'm really excited to introduce our speaker today. Uh, he is Dr. Stefan Esser, who is the co-founder and director at the Esser Health uh, at Esser Health in Ponte Vedra Beach uh, down in Florida. Um, Dr. Esser is a sports and lifestyle medicine physician. He attended the esteemed Harvard Medical School and completed his sports fellowship at Mayo Clinic. Uh, he is a former elite tennis player, fourth generation plant-based eater, which I'm really excited to hear about, uh, and nationally sought after speaker. So we're so fortunate to have him with us today. Uh, Dr. Esser's presentation is titled Lifestyle Interventions for Joint Health, uh, during which you will learn the science on how the food you eat can radically affect common conditions of arthro arthroarthritis, tendon injuries, and osteoporos osteoporosis, and so much more. So get ready to embark on a journey of knowledge and empowerment uh, as Dr. Esser sheds light on this incredible topic. So let's dive in and see what Dr. Esser has for us today. So hello, Dr. Esser, and welcome to our program today. Thank you for being with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm excited to get to join some, uh, share some of the thoughts on this topic, which is probably my topic I'm probably most fascinated with and most excited about because it uh, brings into alignment my two passions, which is movement, uh, nutrition, and of course, our musculoskeletal health. For those of you who don't know, I grew up in a pretty crazy place for 65 years. My grandfather ran a health branch in South Florida, where about 30 people at a time would stay in reverse disease through food and exercise. So he ran this from 1948 until 2001. When he was about 91 years old, he retired. And so I grew up watching literally thousands of people come to this place over my years of growing up and reversing disease through the personal choices they made. So I always like to give credit where credit's due, and I'll say I'll be on his shoulders the rest of my life, certainly, uh, in how he impacted people's lives for good. And that's my reason for being here today. Whenever I have an invitation to share some thoughts, I'm happy to do so in hopes that it inspires you and gets you to realize just how powerful the personal choices are that you're making. He spoke about my pedigree of education. The last 10 years, I was in a large orthopedic practice seeing about 6,000 patient visits a year. And that's a lot of people. And that was on average. And so uh, in addition, I was on faculty for family medicine fellowships and uh, sports medicine fellowships and PT fellowships. And I was the team physician for the Vision One University of North Florida, all their athletics. So had an opportunity to treat everyday athletes, uh, people with just bad arthritis of joints, all the way to elite level collegiate and professionals. And so during this time, I had the opportunity to kind of see not only what the standard of care is, but also things beyond the standard of care that really should be part of the standard of care and integrating all of these from my personal experiences and exposures as a child through my Harvard and Mayo education, integrating all these together to try to maximize performance and function. And that's what I hope you'll derive out of my talk today. Some ideas of how food and movement 
are incredibly powerful for your orthopedic health and well being. When people come to see me in clinic, they come for purposes of pain, a loss of function, an alteration in performance, or to prevent issues that they may be dealing with. You and I are all human. We all experience some of these issues, the pain, a loss of function, an alteration of performance. And whether it be that you're trying to take milliseconds off your runtime, or whether it be that you're trying to get up and down the stairs, it turns out that there's a lot of interrelationships that apply to both extremes of kind of the human condition. Now let's start with pain. Pain can come in three major flavors, either anatomic issues, biomechanical issues, or physiologic issues. These are the three foundational things that can induce cause or be related to pain. So there might be that fracture, there may be that significant advanced osteoarthritis, right? there may be that tumor or the large disc herniation. These are anatomic issues that in fact may need an anatomic fix. So the person who has the bone that's fractured sticking through the skin, they need that hardware. They need those stainless steel screws in order to put things back together. But for the majority of us, the majority of the time, it turns out that biomechanics and physiology play massive parts in the health of our cartilage, our ligaments, our bones, our tendons, and these other structures. So biomechanics, when we talk about that, you know, two gears can look great. But if the gears aren't lined up right, they're not going to work. They're going to chafe. They're going to create heat and squeaks and mess your car up. And so the alignment of the structures of our body heavily influences their wear and their function. Right away, you being scientists, thinking in your brain, I am a scientist for my body. I'm the CEO of my own health, right, as well. You should be thinking about, yeah, well, alignment. Alignment of what? Alignment of your joints. Well, how are your joints held together? By muscles. And how are the muscles conditioned by exercise, by movement, by use? And so biomechanics is heavily influenced by the strength and function of various muscle groups. The most basic biomechanical thing that we all can talk about is our weight, right? Because it turns out that one pound above the waist equals three to 10 on each joint below the waist. So when you're squatting, when you're climbing up and down stairs, when you're running, that's six to 10 times your body weight through every time you hit the ground. Amazing to think about. Because that means if you just take 10 pounds off upstream, it's like 100 pounds off of downstream, right? And what is the greatest predictive risk factor of wearing your knees out? Turns out it's your weight. It's the number one predictive risk factor in America today. In fact, if you're obese, you increase your risk of a knee or hip replacement by 500% over the next 30 years of your life. It's pretty radical. But it's same in our upper extremities. Think about if I gave you a five pound weight and asked you to walk around with it in your arm all day long, you would fatigue even though it's just a small weight very quickly. Well, if you're carrying a lot of extra weight on your arms, right, as some of us do, well, that's fatiguing your rotator cuff. That's fatiguing your traps, your scalenes, all the neck muscles through here are gonna fatigue earlier. It's drawing you forward into more of what we call a lordotic position, right? And this kyphotic rounding of the mid back, all of that overloads all these structures and leads to have normal mechanics. This is the same downstream in the low back, for example. We know that, for example, pregnant women have the highest rates of low back pain. Why is that? Because the belly is pulling them forward, causing a curvature in the low back, which leads to facet-based pain or arthritis in the low back. So the stronger that core is, the less abdominal fat the person carries, the stronger the butt is, the more it corrects that alignment, we get less early arthritis. Is the same in the knees as we'll learn about. But it turns out that our weight, it's not just biomechanical. The other problem is that it releases molecules called adipokines. Adipose meaning fat and cytokine, an inflammatory molecule. Combine them together, it means adipokines, or that's the term. And these little molecules are produced by your fat. They circulate through your bloodstream and they damage your cartilage everywhere. That is why studies show that if your BMI is elevated, you have a higher rate of hand arthritis not because you walk on your hands, because the adipokines are being pumped out all day, every day. So you need to research this, if you're not familiar with this topic, adipokine. It turns out that adipokine concentration in your bloodstream correlates with your risk of heart disease, diabetes, stroke, and the list goes on, along with osteoarthritis. And yes, as you see here, right, if you're 18 in the highest BMI category, you have a five-fold increased risk of joint replacement in your lifetime. And this is why I look at the article at the very bottom published all the way back in 2008 saying there needs to be immediate action for greater clinical and public health interventions and focus on weight loss and self-management 
And yet we as a culture are doing horrifically with this. Do you know that by 2030, the New England Journal of Medicine published an article a year and a half ago, said that by 2030, 50% of every state will be obese. And that the number one BMI category in women, Blacks, and Hispanics will be severe obesity. That is unbelievable to think about. Not just obese, severe obesity will be the number one BMI category in women. What is going on, right? And what are, how are we addressing this? The reality is you and I have great power in this, right? And that's crucial to think about. Because the food that we put into our mouth, it turns out, can be radically predictive of our weight. And while we've all seen junk food vegans who are eating, you know, black bean brownies loaded with tons of sugar, the reality is that the more plants you eat on average, the lower your BMI is. That's simple. And why would that be? Well, that'd be because of this calorie density model. You see vegetables are 100 calories per pound, fruits 300, rice 500, beans 600, meat 1,000 on average. Then we get processed carbohydrates like bread and pasta, then junk food, then nuts and oil. So if your goals are a healthy weight, if your goals are to lose weight, for example, you need to consume more food in the green. It's that simple. So I tell patients, for example, I'm not asking you to join a cult. What I'm asking you to do is to trade out three scoops of hog and dogs with a few berries and instead do a pint of berries and one scoop of hog and dogs, right? At least start there. Every snack should be berries and pineapple and apples and pears rather than chips, you know, and puffs and all kinds of random carbohydrates that are processed. But the more that you eat in the green, the lower on average your BMI will be. Again, you can see here, 500 calories in your stomach of fruits and vegetables versus potatoes, rice, and beans, et cetera. And what you notice is that the beauty of the model is you can eat unlimited quantities and yet still lose weight and be at a healthy weight. You see, there's a mistake in America right now. The, the, uh, people say, you eat too much. It's like, yeah, no, 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 actually, that's not the issue. It's the food that is being consumed is the issue. It is the rare genetics that allows a person to eat unlimited quantities of calorie-dense food-like substances and not put on weight. That's very rare. And that's why, as I mentioned, 50% of Americans by 2030 will, in fact, be obese. That the genetics is not what the problem is. And we should be like all other creatures on earth, eating ad libitum, eat when you're hungry, eat to fullness and move on. But if you eat what you're intended for, that works. If you eat what I call food-like substances of abuse, that doesn't work well, right? So that thing that you buy at Dairy Queen that's got you know, your ice cream, your whipped cream, your chocolates, your pralines in it, your all the rest, these are all make-believe foods that have an intense bliss point that lights up dopamine release in your brain and makes you eat well beyond satiety. So that weight wears out our joints though. And as they say in Boston and Maine, don't leave the snow on the roof too long. As you leave the snow on the roof, the roof collapses. When the roof collapses, there's nothing you can do. You've got to get the roof snow off the roof. This is why I say to patients, if your BMI is elevated, this is not the time to go out for a walk. While walking is wonderful, I'd rather you biked, ellipticized, or swam to get your cardio so you're not beating your joints up. And number two, you've got to focus on the nutrition. All the big studies show the same thing. 80% of weight loss is nutrition. It is not exercise. The two pillars of health go beautifully together, movement and nutrition. But it is the nutrition that is the primary driver of weight loss. They've done multiple studies randomizing people to either just strictly exercise, strictly nutrition, or nutrition and exercise. The nutrition and exercise people do the best, but only by a small percentage as compared to the straight nutrition people. So make sure that what you're doing, if you are carrying extra weight, you're not getting out there just beating your joints up, hoping to lose the weight, because by the time you do, your joints will be now so beat up that it'll be too late right? doesn't make sense. Biomechanically, the second area after weight would be muscle balance. So the way that the muscles are balanced across a joint heavily influences the risk of osteoarthritis. So for example, studies show that the stronger your quads are, the lower the rate of chronic knee pain, degeneration, and osteoarthritic change. So if you're not daily doing your wall slides, your wall slits, sits, your, wall, your air squats, your gentle pushes on the machines, you're missing out on a huge opportunity. If you look down at your quad and there's not a nice muscle there, you're missing out on an opportunity to protect your knee from progressive degeneration. That's what the studies tell us. Not only the quad, but also your lateral hip. When's the last time you laid on your side and did sideline leg lifts? Gentlemen, that's not just for the ladies. 
ladies, that's not just for the exercisers. That's for all of us. So this morning I got up, I laid on my side. I did my 35 sideline leg lifts along with a core program. Did it on both sides. I'm going to do it again this evening. Why? Because I have a goal. My goal as I enter deeper into my 40s and then my 50s and my 60s is to be active, to be able to do what I want to do with my body. But that requires the body to be conditioned, to be cared for, right? And so we need to make sure, right? You cannot just, you know, go, well, I did my best. And yet you're not even doing your quad sets. You're not even doing your sideline leg lifts and your clamshells. Walking is outstanding. It's a wonderful way to get activity, to see the world, to get some cardiovascular benefit. It does very little to build muscle bulk in your legs. Very little. You could get away with just trimming along, walking, and you'll still have little stick legs, not good, strong quads. So you need to make sure you are building some of that quad strength so that when you are walking, your knee is solid. It's doing this, the femur and the tibia. Just have a nice articulation, clean, boom, 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 boom. But if you've got weak quads and imbalanced leg muscles and weak lateral hips, there's going to be an uneven wear, more like this, and there's going to be a lot of rattling around in what we call micro motion. And that micro motion fatigues and wears down the cartilage and you get more arthritis. So how is all the walking helping you? It's not. You need to make sure you've got strong muscles and then go for those walks, right? And get that heart rate up and get the breathing going, et cetera. And also get that benefit from your brain. You probably know this, but the Mayo Proceedings says that exercise is the leading preventive for Alzheimer's disease. You also may be familiar that in the case of mild and moderate depression, exercise is as effective as Prozac. So getting your exercise every day is as effective in head-to-head -head comparative studies as taking a drug. I mean, that's beautiful. So if you struggle with a little bit of mood up and down, or you're getting some of that seasonal affective disorder during the cold times of year, you need to get that exercise every single day, even if it's not outside. But there is a relationship like this in every major region of the body. You've got the neck, the shoulder, the low back, the hips, et cetera. All of them have the same correlation. If you have, for example, let's look at the neck. If I'm just pec dominant, I'm always doing stuff out here. I'm always rounded on the computer. My neck's going to start floating forward. Every inch that my ears are ahead of my shoulders doubles the weight of the head on the neck. I want this ear to be equal to my shoulders. That's where I should be sitting. I need, for example, when I'm on a computer, my screen should be up equal to my ears. So it pulls me up into here rather than my screen being down here, which immediately is going to pull me forward. But the more that I'm forward, the more I fatigue my facet joints. I increase arthritic change and spinal degeneration. This is all the same interrelationship. The good simplicity is that for most of us as humans, the issue is we get tight fronts, that could be our hip flexors and our pelvis or our pecs upstream, and we get weak posterior muscles. So we all need to be doing more low rows, kickbacks, pull downs for our upper body, and more glute pushbacks and things like that to strengthen. So improving the flexibility of our pecs in the front and of our hip flexors in the front, right? Strengthening the buttocks muscles, the lateral hips, et cetera stretching out those pecs, all of these huge value, right? This is a great example. This is a low back. This big muscle you see here is called the iliopsoas. It extends from the mid low back all the way down into your femur and the thigh bone. When you sit for long periods of time, this muscle shortens. So now that it's short, when you try to stand up, it throws you into lordosis. Does this look like a familiar posture to you? Yeah, for most humans it is. And many people go, oh, my belly, I don't know where this is from. I, I don't even need that much. Or the women will say, well, I had three kids. You know, this happened. But the reality is it's much of it poor posture. If you round the thoracic spine, that leaves this more, right? This is less tight. As a result, it just kind of balloons forward. And if you're in lordosis here, right, with this arched back, same thing. This is all about how tight these hip flexors are. If the hip flexor is tight, it's going to draw you into thoracic kyphosis and a lumbar lordosis, which then leads to the belly like this and overloads the facet joints here. So you get arthritis in the low back and you get, you know, depression on the front because you're like, where did that belly come from? <laughs> but what's the answer? Well, first, you've got to strength, stretch out this hip flexor, all your quad stretches and runners stretches your hip flexors, and then strengthen the buttocks muscles to help normalize this. So we don't overload the facet joints in the low back. Strength is a real issue as we age. There's something called sarcopenia, age-related muscle loss. And the, right, if you look here, you can see young, healthy muscle, very dense, a lot of muscle in it. 
more older sarcopenic muscle, a lot more so the sort of interwoven soft tissue and less actual muscle. This happens to the majority of us as we age. The great example, this thigh on an MRI is the same girth as this thigh. Again, look at the difference in the muscle. So here we've lost the muscle mass, we've gained fat mass. Many people I see in clinics say to me, oh, Dr. Esser, I, I, I'm very fit, I'm very active. I go, no, you're not doing enough. I grab my ultrasound, I put it on their leg and I show them how their leg is now one third fat, right? Instead of just a thin overlying level of little superficial fat and then all muscle. So don't kid yourself. It's worth actually getting it. They can do DEXA type scans for uh, how much lean muscle mass you can go and also have different pods where you go into water and they test your lean muscle mass. You can all have fat calipers that they do. You can do an ultrasound of your leg. There are a lot of fun ways to actually look and see how's my lean muscle mass doing. For me, I'm a young, slim guy overall, like out playing tennis, being active, et cetera. And I realized, wow, I don't have the lean muscle mass I used to, right? Because I'm not building it on a regular basis. So what I do, I pulled out the weights and we're starting back. Try to rebuild some lean muscle mass. And you can at any age, it turns out, rebuild it. And you should, because here you go. This is National Conference on Aging. No single feature of age-related decline could be more dramatically affected all the valuable things than lean muscle mass, lean body mass. This is a, one, a huge predictor. So you might say, well, I'm healthy. I don't have high blood pressure. My cholesterol is not up. I don't have type 2 diabetes. Well, great, go you. But how's your lean body mass? right? As it predicts your function, performance, and ability. Every single day, you should be doing something to stimulate the muscles and to thereby help build more lean muscle mass. And here's the truth. The only proven approach to slowing sarcopenia or age-related muscle loss is exercise. And I love this quote, Joseph Pilates, physical fitness can neither be achieved by wishful thinking nor outright purchase, right? How true indeed. So we must all commit every day. My grandfather has a great flyer. I still have it on my website on Esther Health under our history page. And it says, men and women in your 50s and 60s don't go on the shelf. And how true that is. I still have my, you know, many people, they hit 50. You're like, well, you know, you know, that's for younger people. I did that. I used to be so fit. I see so many people in clinic that drive me crazy where they say, oh, I used to be so fit. I used to be this. I used to be that. I'm like, why are we talking about 20 years ago? We should be talking about now, the best version of you today, not living out, oh man, in high school, I was the top track and field. But okay, well, what are you doing now? Why are you sitting on the couch watching the third you know, edition of Netflix, you know, Yellowstone? I don't really care. Like you should be doing your exercise. You're gonna watch videos and movies, exercise at the same time. That's what you should be doing. There's no excuse except for excuses. There are lots of those, right? But it's interesting, right? Because I have my grandfather's weights. I'm looking at them right here in the corner of my eye over here. They're these 25 pound old stainless steel dumbbells. And I remember it was interesting because I used to go in his room uh, at our house. We all lived in a three generation home. He had his own sort of apartment area. And right by his bed, he had a slant board, an old classic slant board, and he had these weights. And every single morning he'd get up, he'd say his prayers and he'd work out. Every single morning, even into his 90s. And he always had these nice muscles, right? All through his 80s, et cetera could lift all the boxes, do whatever, you know, we'd all work together all the time. And I never thought much of it until now I started to become more an older individual, right? In my forties, et cetera, now myself. And I'm like, I get it. That's why he did it. He was channel factoring his life. If you're not familiar with that term of channel factoring, it's to make easy or simple or straightforward things that you prioritize. So in other words, for example, if you want to prioritize your nutrition, you should only have healthy food in your home. Because otherwise, you're not being serious about it, right? So it's kind of in my home. I joke that the least healthy food I have in my home are cashews. Well, it's true. So if I want to eat something unhealthy, like a bunch of chips and fries or whatever, I have to get my car, drive somewhere, pay extra money and pick it up. I'm too lazy to do that. I'm not going to do that. But if I had chips in my pantry, you better believe that after a long day in clinic or you know, a fight with my wife or some other thing, I'd go into those things. I'd grab those chips and eat the whole bag. Right? Or if I was watching the TV show, I'd be like, I don't know what's in here. Oh, I'll grab these, right? But if you channel factor your life, right? For example, so with exercise, do you have shoes that you like? Do you have access to a place you can exercise safely and consistently, whether it be in your home or outdoors or at a gym or a facility that you enjoy? And 
for example, let's say you work at a job where you drive a certain way. Well, and when you get home, you're like, well, I'm not going to leave now. I don't want to go exercise now. And I don't like exercise in my home. Well, are you willing to change the way you drive? Do you have to drive by the gym or by the Pilates studio or whatever it might be, or the tennis courts, et cetera? And if you're going to do that, do you always pack your clothes and shoes the night before so they're in your car? See, all these things are channel factor in your life. So right here to the left, right, I'll turn this actually on this door. You can see I have bands hanging on that door. <laughs> so if I walk through that door, but it goes to my laundry area, et cetera, I'm always like, oh, there are the bands. Quick, just do a couple rows before I go in there. Right? Kind of thing. And I've got bands similar to that actually in an eye hook in my bedroom. So which is over on the other side of the house, which if I wake up in the morning, I've got a TRX. This is funny. I've got a TRX hanging from the ceiling in my bedroom, which if you know, there's those big band things that you can just kind of hang from. I've got open beam ceilings in my house, so it's easy to put an eye hook in a beam. And so, but literally, like if I'm talking to my wife or, you know, before bed or something, I just grab on the TRX and do some hanging rows, 30 quick rows. Why? Because I want to be fit as long as possible. And you should too, because it sets you free, doesn't it? You know, I love this Jack Lane quote. Most older people just give up. They think I'm too old for that because they have an ache here or a pain there. Well, life's a pain in the butt and you've got to work at it. And that is so true. And it is worth continuing to. You know, exercise is one of the most powerful therapeutics. These red numbers are directly from the medical literature showing how much exercise reduces your risk of each of these things. So if you don't want heart disease, if you don't want colon cancer, if you don't want breast cancer, et cetera, you should be integrating exercise into your life every single day. I mean, that's just always blowing my mind because how many people out there are taking drugs and medications and supplements to prevent things, whatever it might be, and yet they're failing to recognize just how powerful exercise is. The studies say, for example, a woman can reduce her risk of breast cancer by almost 50% if she exercises 30 minutes every day. It's pretty huge. Just exercise alone. Now add to that reducing toxic exposures in food and alcohol and things like that, and you reduce it even more. But physical exercise also does other great things, doesn't it? It improves your balance. It reduces your fall risk. It, it gets your bowels moving, right? So you have less constipation. You have more energy. Here was some of the comments I made on depression and Alzheimer's dementia and mental clarity. Why? Because when you exercise, you improve blood flow to your brain. And that improved blood flow carries more nut nutrients to your brain. Win, 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 and more wins. All what we want. Exercise is medicine. You've got to think about it in that fashion every day. And you've got to say, I want to take this. I need to take it. I will take it. And it should look like this. These are the federal recommendations. 150 minutes per week of cardiovascular. That can be in as small doses as 10 minutes a day. Don't be overwhelmed. Now you can take 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, get a little bit of activity. And that benefit of cardiovascular exercise is highest when you can talk but not sing. That means it's moderate intensity. You can talk but not hold a note, right? So you're kind of right in the, yep, I'm breathing a little bit here. This is good. And for you, literally, that may be jogging in place as you're waiting for the boiling pot of water to put your pasta in. I mean, you see, here's the problem, right? If you say the only way I will or can exercise is going to this gym down the road, and then you go, well, yeah, but I'm working two jobs, have three kids, caring for a sick loved one, it's raining outside, it's sleeting in snow. Guess what you just did? You made all kinds of excuses that then say you can't achieve the actual goal. But you never said that the real goal is to go to a gym. You said the goal is to exercise. So you've got to make sure that you reroute in your brain what the real goal is, right? Because it's for me, it's like, sure, I would love every day to go to the gym for an hour and a half a day and work out with weights and machines and all that. I think it'd be awesome. I, I used to do that. I love it. But then I couldn't be present for my wife and be a good husband. I couldn't be present for my children and be a present father. I couldn't be present for my patients, right? And be a physician who makes an income to help my family. I couldn't be here giving talks like these for folks like you. I couldn't be doing all these other things. When am I going to do that? I don't have the hours in the day unless I'm going to wake up at 3 a.m., 4 a.m. And now I'm not getting sleep, which of course is negative for my overall long-term health. But you know what I can do is I can do a quick 25 to 30 push-ups waiting for the water to boil for my morning oatmeal before I make it for my kids. I can do countertop push-ups when I'm on a conference call. I can sit on a bike with a stationary bike in my house and do my medical notes while I pedal. I can do all these different ways of integrating my fitness so that I achieve one of my real goals, the big goals, and then I stay fit and strong and active as well. You just got to be creative. And you've got to be willing to make the commitment. But the biomechanical aspects of how exercise influences and slows orthopedic issues is incredibly powerful.
Now, what about physiology? We're going to talk about these major areas of physiology because all these areas influence the progression of arthritis and degeneration in your body. Let's start with arachidonic acid. You're all familiar with arachidonic acid. Why? Because you take drugs that block it all the time. Arachidonic acid is converted into a sub substances called prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are little molecules that inflame your tissues. Great example, a woman's period, her uterus hurts so much because prostaglandin F2 alpha pisses off the uterus. And it's arachidonic acid is the parent molecule that converts down to prostaglandins. But guess who blocks that conversion? You can see it right there. NSAIDs, anti-inflammatories, ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve, Naproxen, Duexis, all those. They inhibit the conversion of arachidonic acid into prostaglandins. But here's what's interesting. Guess where uh, arachidonic acid comes from? Look at this right here. This is a food survey study. The leading sources of arachidonic acid are meat products. So when you remove the majority of the meat from your diet, you now have less arachidonic acid in the lake and as a result, there's less in the lake to then go down the stream. Very interesting. And this is why the majority of people who do my four or six week detoxes, which are all 100% plant-based, the majority of them have reported about 70% improvement in their joint pain, just from the food, which is really cool because they decrease the consumption and exposure of arachidonic acid. In addition, individuals who consume more plants reduce the production of inflammatory molecules in their bloodstream. So it's a win-win. You're not getting exposed to the arachidonic acid as much, and you're also decreasing, right? You're also increasing, forgive me, the production of these anti-inflammatory molecules. In the nutritional world also, it's worthwhile to remember that spices are king and queen. And so when it comes to your osteoarthritic issues, you want to maximize your exposure to these. You can see these nice studies in which people randomized to either anti-inflammatories we commonly use, like ibuprofen, valvocoxib, et cetera, or they were given supplements in higher doses. So I put patients frequently on Boswellia at 1,000 milligrams per day and turmeric at 1,500 milligrams per day. And for the majority of people, it helps significantly. But look at this study, knee arthritis, 1,500 milligrams of turmeric versus 1,200 of ibuprofen, right? That's quite a bit of ibuprofen. That's six small tablets a day. And yet the outcomes were equal, equal benefit. Just took a little longer for the turmeric to take effect but it lasted even longer than the ibuprofen effect. Now, the beauty here, right, is that when you take the turmeric, you also reduce your risk of various cancers, cognitive decline, generalized inflammation, et cetera. When you take the ibuprofen, you increase your risk of what? Stroke, heart attack, stomach ulceration, and kidney failure. So again, you wanna make sure you're using the least risky substances to maximize your benefit. So add some of these in. In addition, I love to add these to my daily diet. So I buy, for example, little you know, clamshells full of turmeric, right, of the root itself from the store. They have it at Sprouts, Whole Foods, Native Sun, Publix here in Florida, et cetera. So I buy these. And then you take a nice piece about the size of a half the length of your thumb. You throw it in your morning smoothie with blueberries, pineapple, right, spinach. So the spinach is giving you nitrates, which are converted into nitric oxide that dilates your blood vessels. The pineapple is loaded with bromelain, which is a potent anti-inflammatory, it helps with joint pain. The turmeric has the terminoids that reduce inflammation. The blueberries have anthocyanopigments, which are a form of flavanol. And these flavanols are precursor molecules. So again, more nitric oxide that dilates your blood vessels. It's like so cool. I mean, food is truly medicine right along with the exercise. And so you wanna to continue to see what you can do to reduce inflammation at the cellular level. Antioxidant-rich foods are key for your long-term joint health. Think about it. You cut the apple, it turns brown. Why does it do that? It turns brown because it's oxidizing. Oxidation is a source or a form of inflammation. So what you want to be doing more and more is eat foods that are bright, fresh, and go bad quickly. You don't want the stuff that sits on your counter and lasts for three weeks. That stuff has all kinds of enzymatic inhibitors, so it's hard for your body to even break it down. You see, there are two aspects to nutrition. We talk all the time about macromolecules, fats, carbohydrates, and proteins. But how many of us talk about micronutrients, which are where the actual game, you know, sort of changers are? Because you can get fat from lots of sources. You can get carbohydrates, lots of sources, and proteins from lots of sources. But the micronutrients, in large part, are derived from plant-based sources. So all of these things like quercetin and cinnamaldehyde and ferulic acid, things that actually induce stem cell regeneration. These are all derived from things like phenyl, that's where ferulic acid, cinnamaldehyde from cinnamon, right? Quercetin from red onions, so on and so forth. So we want to be eating these foods in their least 
process form. Another way in which inflammation can be altered and heavily influences joint health are in autoimmune conditions, right? We know that autoimmune conditions where your body attacks itself, the body begins to break down your joints. And it turns out that there is this sort of very rich intertwining of how healthy your gut is, right? The, the molecules getting into your bloodstream now inducing tissue mimicry and then damaged cartilage, et cetera. But long story short is studies show that the more fruits and vegetables you consume, the healthier your gut is, the less likely to have leaky gut and the less likely to induce autoimmune conditions. So again, to protect your joints from the autoimmune inflammation, you want more of the plant-based matter. What about blood flow? You know, blood flow is truly king, isn't it? I mean, without good blood flow to tissues, things die off. That's heart attacks, strokes, kidney failure, right? Peripheral vascular disease, amputations of the feet. Uh, this is all about blood flow. And the more that we consume uh, the standard American diet, the more that we block blood flow to our tissues. So for example, individuals who block blood flow begin to have elevated blood pressure. Studies show that blood pressure correlates directly with risk of osteoarthritis of your joints. Fascinating. The studies came out in the last three years, multiple showing this interrelationship. But if your blood pressure is elevated, it increases pressure in your bones. And when the pressure is increased in your bones, less blood gets to the surface of the bone where the cartilage is. And as a result, the cartilage dies off early because it's a relative low oxygen state. But studies done at Johns Hopkins showed that it's not decades of eating, but it's actually every meal that makes a big difference. They took healthy volunteers and fed them a single high fat, high cholesterol meal, and they had decreased blood flow through their primary arteries by up to 50% for four hours after each meal. That's crazy. That means you have the bacon and the eggs for breakfast. You got the cheeseburger at lunch and you've got the beef stroganoff for dinner you're just inhibited all day long, right? Your blood vessels are, have impaired blood flow all day long. But on the flip side, studies show done at Johns Hopkins again, that you give people spinach, blueberries, dark chocolate, beet juice, et cetera, you actually ameliorate the negative effects of the high fat meal. In other words, what I'm saying to you is if you're gonna to go to a barbecue, don't say, well, I won't eat for three days after. No, no, no. You say, I'm gonna immediately eat a massive salad as well to offset the negative effects of the high fat, high cholesterol food that is inhibiting blood flow. That's what the studies show. You see, again, I'm a Harvard Mayo guy. We should be following the science. This is what the data says. It's not my personal opinion. And so the studies out of Johns Hopkins, repetitive studies show this again and again, give people these micronutrient dense foods, their blood vessels dilate, give them high fat, high cholesterol, like the fries and the chips, et cetera. You make the blood vessels get smaller. Great example of this is this picture. I spin down biologics all day. I do PRP, stem cell injections, et cetera. This is plasma, the water content of people's blood. You can see the one on this side right here that's clear, you can see right through is from a plant-based person who came to see me. This is from someone who had like a fish sandwich right before they came. This is lipemia. This is all the fat in their bloodstream from the meal they just ate. Well, if that's running through the bloodstream all day, it's like well water in your house. It clogs up over time, the arteries. And as a result, the pipes get crusty and disgusting. And that's why every 37 seconds in America, someone dies of a heart attack. There's no magic here. It is the chronic exposure to this deleterious nutrition that causes this impaired blood flow. And we see how this influences degeneration of our spines as well. Studies show that if you do an x-ray of a person's back and you look at this big aorta, this huge blood vessel running along the spine, if you look at their x-rays and you see, see the white right here? See the white right here? This white is aortic calcifications. It is hardening of the arteries. It is heart disease of the aorta. Studies show that if you see that on x-ray, individuals who have that have higher rates of chronic back pain and spinal degeneration. Well, I can tell you this is as common as clouds in the sky. When I x-ray people's backs, which 6,000 patient visits a year, I was x-raying people's backs left and right nonstop in an orthopedic practice. I would tell you probably about 60% of people over the age of 35 have these aortic calcifications. Why? It's just heart disease. And Americans have heart disease. It's the number one cause of death because of our diets. And as a result, they have higher rates of spinal degeneration and chronic pain. In addition, studies show that if you get your lipid panel checked and you have elevated cholesterol and LDL, you have higher rates of rotator cuff tear, you have higher rates of re-injury after surgery, and you're more likely to fail surgery and have slowed impaired healing. Why? Uh, blood flow, same thing. 
the, the tendons require these teeny tiny little vessels about the size of a hair to feed them with nutrients. Well, golly, if, if the big vessels are impaired, just, you know, the tiny ones are just gone, completely dried up. So we're not getting adequate blood flow. And this plays out also in studies in the Achilles tendon. So these primary big tendons, which they've done studies show this. And I am curious one day to see the literature, there's none published yet, but that also individuals with chronic tendinopathies like tennis elbow or golfer's elbow or knee jumper's knee, these individuals likely also have elevated levels of lipids that don't allow the tendons to heal adequately and stay in a chronic inflamed state. It makes total sense because we see it in the big tendons, likely in the smaller as well. But the good news is you can alter your perfusion or blood flow by eating stuff that looks like this. There are all these great studies, right? Simple studies looking, for example, at, you know, drink six ounces of pomegranate juice a day and it dilates your blood vessels over several weeks. All of a sudden you have improved blood flow to your heart just by doing that. Are you kidding me? Right? So you should be looking at your meals every day. And if you say, wow, I didn't get enough in today, well, then go to the blender, throw a bunch of, you know, spinach or kale or mixed greens, bunch of berries you know, some nice berries, blend them up and suck them down, right? If you, I will tell you, spinach is the least, you know, sort of flavorful. So it's the easiest to blend into your smoothies, but blend that up and drink it down. You can easily get several huge handfuls of spinach, half a banana, a big cup or two of frozen berries, a little bit of water in there, zoop, and you drink that in two to three minutes. And yet it would have taken you 30 minutes to eat it all. It's a great way to get it in if you're unwilling to get it in any other way. But the better the perfusion, right, the better healing, the lower the risk of infection, so on and so forth. And again, here's some fun studies for those of you who like science, like I do, you know, showing that even kayakers, sprinters, cyclists, et cetera, you give them some beet juice or pomegranate juice, they can go farther, longer, harder, get less muscle soreness the day after, so on and so forth. I mean, this is cool stuff. And this is what you and I should be thinking about every day. Again, whether our goal is just to walk across the parking lot to our car or whether the goal is to sprint that Ironman triathlon right? Whatever the goal is, recognize that what you're putting in your body is more than just fuel. It actually significantly alters performance. Oh, here was a slide on adipokines that I thought you might enjoy. That's right. And so again, there's that belly fat produces all these things with these weird names like leptin, resistant, and interleukin-6, et cetera. And then this goes to all kinds of different areas in the body causing havoc, right? And causing harm. And this is what we want to shut down. So if you look at yourself in the mirror tonight, and you notice that you've got a, you know, a three-month pregnancy going on and you're not really pregnant, uh, you know, this is something you need to address, right? This is not something to put on the back burner. And the really only good way to get rid of this visceral fat is aggressive nutritional modifications. That's the heart of this, right? Exercising your way out of a bad diet is almost impossible. It is so, so hard to do. And you know, what we see here, this is from one of the scientific journal articles, just shows us how these different pro-inflammatory cytokines, right? These pro-inflammatory mediators, they circulate into the bloodstream, then they go into the joint, and then here they damage, right? They, they turn on all of these enzymes in your knees, things like metalloproteases, they're called, that cause degeneration, enzymatic de degradation of your cartilage layer. And so you're sleeping, this is happening. You're awake, this is happening. You're exercising, this is happening. It is just tragic, right? And that's why I'm here to share this message so you fully understand that what your belly fat, if you're carrying extra fat, is leading to the degeneration of your joints and the progression of our osteoarthritis. And you don't want that. It turns out, right, our final point here is that biomechanics and bio, you know, chemistry are closely linked then, right? You're carrying the extra belly fat, it's wearing out your joints due to the biomechanical effect. It's also releasing adipokines in a physiologic biochemical effect. So, you know, both negative for your body. So in order for you to win here, we want you to really get in and say, okay, my goals are to reduce pain. If so, here's some ideas, right? If my goal is to improve perfusion, right? Get more blood flow, get more nutrients carried to the target tissues, which takes us back to this slide. Pain, loss, function, alteration, performance, and prevention. Here are my principles for you to lead with. Number one, evaluate your own personal need as well as your readiness for change. Yeah, your own personal need, yeah? Do you have pain? Loss of function, age over 50, you have high blood pressure, what's going on? Why should you consider integrating exercise and better nutrition 
into your orthopedic portfolio. But you need to know why you're doing something, right? I know I'm doing things. Sure, I've got some issues of chronic pain here and there. I don't want to lose my function. I'm getting close to that 50 mark. I've had injuries over the years. So do my therapies and exercises helps keep me out of pain, right? Weight's not an issue. I don't have blood pressure, blood sugar issues, so on and so forth, right? But you need to know for yourself, what are your goals? You should write them down. You should put them by your bedside or in your journal. You actually look at them. So the times when you're not motivated, you go, no, 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 no. But I do care about this. I'm going to do it. And evaluate where you are in your stages of change. Prochaska, right? So well known for his stages of change in lifestyle modification, right? Are you in that place where you're just, yeah, you haven't even thought about it. You're pre-contemplation. I don't know about exercise. I don't think I want to add it in. Are you in the contemplation? You're like, I know I need to do it, right? Or are you in the preparation phase? I've, I've, I'm already looking up gyms. I bought some shoes recently. They're coming from in the mail, right? So whatever it might be, right? But check where you are in each of these aspects of your life and your nutrition, your sleep and your exercise and your emotions and see where you need the most work. Because you may be hitting it out of the ballpark when it comes to your exercise, but maybe your nutrition is lousy, especially on Thursday, Friday and Saturday nights when you're watching whatever. Yeah. So kind of look where you can have the most effect. Identify the openings in your own life, right? As I like to say to people, stop being a leaf. Don't be blown every which way by emotions and feelings and this, that, and the other. Instead, be a CEO. You are in charge of your own health company. Be in charge of it and act accordingly, right? If the building is getting older, well, what do you need to do to maintain that building? Structurally sound, et cetera. Number two, determine clinically the extent of change needed for the result. Yeah. You and I might never be like we were when we were 15. But that's okay. That doesn't mean that we can't be amazing at 58 right? Or it's 69 or 78, right? You want to be the best version of you now. I had a woman I saw yesterday in clinic, she's 76 years old. And she and I had, had a conversation before recently about nutrition and therapeutic exercise. So she was now doing the exercise for her shoulder where she has a rotator cuff tear. And she was also aggressively doing nutrition. She's lost 20 some pounds of belly fat at 76 and her shoulder no longer hurts her because she's doing a rotator cuff program. She said, this is great. You know, now I've started hiking with my husband a little bit. We're having a little more fun. That's what it's all about. But make sure that you evaluate, like, what do you really need to do to try to achieve what is a reasonable goal? So if your example say, well, I'm going to start doing weights and I really want to build up some lean muscle mass. And then you're only doing weights once every two weeks. That's not going to cut it. You need to be in there three to five days per week, pressing something hard and heavy. Number three, develop a plan of care. Identify what the goal is, set up a plan, do it, right? So if your goal is that you wanted to actually start a good walking program, well, what are you doing to achieve that? Do you have the appropriate shoe wear? Do you have the appropriate assistive device? Do you have difficulty with balance or coordination? Do you have some good walking sticks, right? Do you have a friend or a workout buddy? Do you have a place you can walk safely and consistently? So on and so forth. You've got to walk through all of these pieces of the puzzle. So, you know, are you wanting to prevent, reverse, reduce, or eliminate diseases, medications, so on and so forth? What, what, what's going on for you, right? A great example. Here's a person uh, I've seen, 72-year-old male, low back pain, you know, saw he had aortic calcifications. I told him he was going to die and he needed to change his behavior, right? And he was also told me he was tired of his meds. So I said, let's do some PT and I want you to do my four-week detox that I sell online that I gave him in clinic. Six weeks, he came back. He was 30 pounds down off all his blood pressure meds. Psoriasis resolved, back pain, 6% improved. He had a huge smile on his face. He was getting his wedding ring resized because his fingers were now smaller. They were no longer chronically swollen from all the excess salt. This isn't make-believe. People, for example, who do my simple program, which is nothing magical. It's just fruits, veggies, beans, and rice, sweet potatoes. Very simple, written out for people. Men lose 20 to 40 pounds. Women lose 15 to 25 in a month. Why? Because they're eating true food that is low calorie density Add libidum, unlimited quantities, instead of eating extremely high calorie density, high salt, oil, fat, and sugar foods. One with advanced knee osteoarthritis, right? Went home, did six weeks of a healthy program, gentle pool swimming, et cetera. Yeah, 28 pounds down, her knee pain was 75% improved. She brought down the biomechanical loading. She brought down the inflammation and she got the mechanisms of the knee moving, got her muscles strengthened, right? Her ligaments working. Number four, right, for you is to track your outcomes, right? What are you going to track? 
write down your pain in your knees right now. The average zero to 10, what are it on average? Recheck it in two weeks from now. See if he's had any better. Is it performance? You can walk further longer. Is it your labs? You wanting to reduce your blood sugars? Is it your weight? Is it your, what is it? But make sure that there's specific goals, not just, I don't know, I want to be healthier. That's like a company CEO takes the job and says, I want our company to do better. It's like, what the heck does that mean? That's not helpful. We actually need actual hard endpoints. We want our earnings to be up by 35% by the end of the year. I want our cash flow to be blank. I want the this, that. I want our workforce to be this size and this productive. And I want our expenditures here to be that. That's what you and I should be thinking. So you need to know your true health. A lot of people in America, they think they're healthy. That's how it's like, no, that's not the, you know, 10 medications. I don't know why the street is not healthy. So you've got to be honest with yourself about where your health really is and also honest about what it is that you can do and be specific in order to achieve that. So I'm going to jump through some of these because we're near the end here. Um, but well, then once you've evaluated your success is to modify accordingly. So don't get sloppy, right? Every month or two, I look at myself in the mirror. I look at my numbers and my stats and I go, how am I doing? Am I really achieving the goal of being the healthiest version of me? And I'll go, oh no, actually you started slipping into some less than ideal habits. You're going to bed past 10. You're still getting up early. You're not as you know calm as you were. You're not doing any sort of meditative work. You're not spending time in spirituality. Okay, I got to get back on the train, right? Because I might be checking the boxes on the exercise and nutrition, but what am I doing for the other areas? If you've got chronic joint pain, number one, get an accurate diagnosis. That's crucial, right? And then identify the goals, your readiness for change, your abilities and limitations, and track your outcomes. Some of the things I encourage people to consider if they've got chronic joint pain, right, is a, an aggressive anti-inflammatory nutrition with gentle movement activities built in based upon their level of dysfunction, or arthritis, and injury, and then building up from there. The truth is there are multiple levels of intersection between food, exercise, and your musculoskeletal health. I want to encourage you to continue to build strong pillars, strong foundations, for your joint health long-term. For you, the tenets of a healthy life look very simple and they're very straightforward. In fact, sometimes they're so simple, people go, they can't be that powerful. But the truth is we've known since the time of Hippocrates that these are powerful. But integrating them into our lives can be set with challenges and problems. But you're powerful and you can work through those challenges, especially if you take on the CEO mindset and mentality. So add more color and micronutrient-rich foods every day. Add spices into your foods and possibly as supplements. Be sure to get some, some form of good, solid exercise every single day. Make sure that BMI is in a healthy range, right? And remember, you may be the most powerful influence of your joints today, tomorrow, and for years to come. With that, I'll close. And I think I've got about five, six minutes before I have to run, but I'm happy to take some uh, questions if there are any questions out there. Yes, there are. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. I, I was taking notes. Um, you said so many things that I, I thought I have to remember that or I've, I need to incorporate that into uh, what I do with my with my clients and my husband. <laughs> um, so we did have, let's see, um, Lindsay had a question. Lindsay, do you want to ask the question or do you want me to do it for you? I can do that. Have, Please do. I have two episodes of kidney stones in the past and they've worn me off of Things like turmeric, all the all the uh, buckwheat family, like spinach, like beets, like you know, so many of the things you mentioned that are supposed to be so wonderful, such wonderful foods. So how do I reach a balance there? Yeah, great question. And did you have kidney stones while you were on a strictly plant-based diet, or were you still on an omnivorous diet? Omnivorous. Yeah. So, so the rates. The episodes are thirty years apart. Gotcha. The rates of kidney stones and strict plant-based eaters is extraordinarily low. Uh, if you actually look at the literature and it appears that the elevated oxalic acid that you're making mention of, like in spinach, things like that, um, often is negatively affected when you're also consuming uh, a high protein animal-based diet. And so the combination of the two in some genetically predisposed individuals can be risky. Uh, but the first place to start for you, if you're concerned about kidney stones, uh, would be to start with low oxalic, you know, greens, which there are many of them out there, and make sure you maximize the consumption there to begin with, and then build up from there. Uh, but I think that if you're adopting more of a micronutrient plant-based diet, your risk radically drops anyway for kidney stones. 
uh, even with a history with some oxalic stones in the past. Wonderful. Uh, anyone else right now have a question, please? Um, sure. Please feel free. Great. So, hi, Steve. Yeah, hi. So I'm 69 and um, I switched over to a whole food plant-based diet about five years ago and lost 50 pounds or so. So now I'm kind of skinny compared to what I used to be. And um, because I'm 69, um, do I have to worry about uh, an inability to grow muscle? Uh, so your ability to build muscle is going to be decreased but related to the amount of testosterone and growth hormone that you have in your body. And so the key, especially if you're doing a whole food plant-based program, is number one, to make sure your calorie needs are being met, right? Because as we suggested, right, you've got to make sure that. So the first place I'd start is to calculate your basic metabolic rate. So just go online and put in BMR calculator, put in your height, weight, and age, and it'll tell you what the average calories you require per day are. Uh, mm -hmm. Then do something like chronometer or myfitnesspal.com, put in everything you eat for like a week and just see on average, how many total calories are you getting, right? And then what concentrations of proteins, fats, carbohydrates, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you may decide that you want to play around a little bit, right? The first thing to say is if you're wanting to build lean muscle mass is number one, are you lifting weights? Because they don't magically build themselves, right? The <laughs> muscle. And it's funny because a lot of people who... For example, look at their body, they go, oh, well, I used to have bigger muscles. Problem was half of that muscle was just fat because it was just integrated into the muscle because they were consuming so many unnecessary calories. It wasn't that it was this incredibly rich muscle unless they're in the gym all the time. Yeah. And so, and really pushing the muscles. So, so, you know, number one is if you wanted to build lean muscle mass, make sure you are doing something with those muscles at a high level of intensity regularly. Right. So five pound weights ain't going to cut it. You start with the five pound weights, then you go to the seven and a half, the 10, the 15, the 12, you know, so on and so forth, building up until you're getting back to the 25 and 30 pound weights. Right. Because you don't jump right in the gym and go, well, I'm going to do 35 overhead. And then you tear your rotator cuff. That's foolish. Right. You start yeah. with light weights, build up your form and technique, and then go bigger. But so if you're doing really good fitness programming, really good strength building, and you're not building the muscle, then you look at, okay, how is my total calorie intake and my protein yeah. amount that I'm consuming? And then you may decide to tinker, for example, with your protein, say, okay, I'm only getting one gram per kilogram or whatever. I'm going to jump up now to one and a half grams per kilogram, whatever it might be, to try to maximize that lean muscle mass building. Mm -hmm. The good news is there are these great studies out of the Buck Institute, which is an NIH anti-aging research institute in California, that shows that whether you're in your 70s and 80s, you can still build lean muscle mass. You've just got to be willing to push the muscles hard, right? So for example, it was fascinating. The other day I did a Murph. A Murph is a, a, a workout from CrossFit and it was on Memorial Day and I just was got suckered into doing it. And uh, I have never done that. And it was like, you know, 100 push-ups or 100 pull-ups, 200 push-ups and 300 air squats. And I was like, I did modify it. I did ring rows and I did kneeling push-ups and all this. But boy, I was incredibly sore for like two or three days after in my quads, my pecs, et cetera. And I was like, I haven't felt this for years. And you know what that yeah. told me? I hadn't been pushing myself hard enough for years, yeah. right? Because if you're not working out hard and then your muscles aren't sore for a day or two after, that means you're not pushing them hard enough. It means yeah. you're just keeping them right where they're comfortable. And as a result, you're not going to build lean muscle mass. So that's crucial for you and I to be aware of. It doesn't mean go do what you did when you were 35. It means start somewhere and start building, right? Yeah. That's going to be the key. So yeah. So yeah, start making, maximize the exercise itself, then look at the nutrient uh, intake, et cetera. Make sure you're checking all the boxes. Yeah. Thank you. Great question. Cool. One or two more before I go. Anybody else? Anyone? I, I actually had a question um, when you were talking, when we were talking about cardiovascular and uh, we're talking about weightlifting, but also that flexibility and balance piece. Um, can you talk a little yeah. bit more about that? Because people go, oh, okay, yeah. What does that even mean? Well, how do I do that? Yeah. Yeah. So loss of balance is a real issue as we age over time. And we also lose coordination and reaction time. So one of the leading risks for falls that then lead to traumatic, you know, fractures of the hip is imbalance and, you know, a loss of reaction time. So when we were kids, we used to climb trees, jump on things, jump on the couch, wrestle our siblings, all these things that built balance, coordination, and reaction time. 
But as we got in our 20s and 30s, it became socially inappropriate to wrestle people to the ground randomly or to jump out, you know, onto cars or climb onto random stuff. People like, what's wrong with you? You need to take your medicine, right? And so the reality, though, is we need to build that into our lives in a socially appropriate way. So that can be ballroom dancing. That can be line dancing in your own home with YouTube videos. That can be standing on one leg with a beach ball, throwing it against the wall for one minute or through your favorite two minute song that you love, you know, whatever it might be. I put on my tie on one leg, standing on one leg, and I put my shirt on while standing on the other leg, right? I brush my teeth on one leg. I build in these little moments of balance throughout the day where I can and when I can. But you can do this in so many different ways. It may pull you out of your comfort zone. That's okay. If you want to do actual like leisure time stuff, that would be Tai Chi, that would be Pilates, that would be yoga, you know, things of that nature, standing on one leg, tree balance stuff, all this. But the reality is there are lots of other ways we can integrate it throughout our days. And then, of course, things, like I said, that are a little out of our comfort zone for most of us, the line dancing, the country dancing, the, this, that, and the other. This is powerful stuff to work on that reaction time. Also, just even taking a ball with a loved one, tossing it. You can be 10 feet away from each other, back and forth, and then toss it a little out of their reach. They have to kind of reach to grab it, reach to grab it, this sort of thing. But working on having to rebalance ourselves, change direction quickly, these are crucial for protecting our joints and our bodies long term. Right. And as you mentioned, re really simple things to do. So I thank you very That's much it. for that. Uh, let's right. see. We're at about, we're at that time. So I'm going to thank you, uh, Dr. Ezra, for this a, a really interesting um, and exciting uh, presentation. Uh, you're a lot of fun to listen to. And I love all of the notes that I've taken. I'm sure uh, I'll have some questions for you uh, later well, on. My pleasure. I've got to run, but keep staying healthy, everybody. Bye. Very good. Thank you. So before everyone else goes, I'm just going to quickly say that we do hope that you found this information today interesting and that you'll be able to incorporate some of the information that Dr. Uh, Esser gave us to uh, really incorporate it into your daily life. We're here again, of course, next week for Wellness on Wednesday, June 14th, and our Dr. Uh, Dr. Lai is going to be back with us. Uh, he's the chief manager at Rochester Clinic, and he's going to be talking about the whole uh, person approach to uh, managing ankle osteoarthritis. Uh, if you haven't seen us uh, or if you have friends that you want to share this program with, uh, you can find the information on Eventbrite. You can find it on LinkedIn. Uh, please share with your friends and uh, we will see you here next week. Uh, same time, same channel. Thanks, everyone.